and you can actually reprogram your brain, like reprogramming a computer, go straight towards your goals. It's going to have some of the great minds of the world in there showing you how you can literally shape your brain and become anything you want to become and accomplish any goal you can set for yourself. Hey there, it's hard to find good help for many people today. With so much information, it's easy to feel overwhelmed and that you don't have any way to sift through the noise. Luckily, motivational speakers can help. Subscribe to us for endless motivation. It's easy to fight when everything's right, when you're mad with the thrill and the glory. It's easy to cheer when victory is near and wallow in fields that are gory. It's a different song when everything's wrong, when you're feeling infernally mortal, when it's ten against one and hope there is none. Buck up, little soldier, and chortle. Carry on, carry on, there isn't much punch in your blow. You're glaring and staring and hitting out blinds. You're muddy and bloody, but never you mind. Carry on, carry on. You haven't the ghost of a show. It's looking like death, but while you have a breath, carry on, my son, carry on. Well, by this time, we were in the Sahara, the largest desert on Earth. It stretches across the Tropic of Capricorn from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea, more than 5,000 miles. And the part that we faced dead ahead was the Tenezrift, the emptiest single stretch of the Sahara, 500 miles of nothing, not a fly, not a blade of grass, as flat as a tabletop, 500 miles. The enormity of what we had embarked on finally, finally began to sink in. We learned that more than 1,300 people had perished in the Tenezrift in the last 20 years. 42 vehicles had broken down in the desert and many of their drivers were never seen again alive. By this time, Jeff and I were once more out of money. All our tires were scraped bald and they needed to be replaced. Uh, we needed additional tanks so we could carry enough gas and water for the crossing. We needed tools to do repairs. We needed a jack and lug wrench so that we could change, lug wrench so we could change tires, obvious. Uh, for three weeks, we stayed in a drawer. Jeff hitchhiked north to Algiers to wire for more money, more creative writing. <laughs> while, while I sold all our supplies except for a bare minimum. With that money and by stripping abandoned vehicles, I got the Land Rover repaired and properly outfitted with reasonably good tires, a reserve gas tank, proper tools and supplies for the crossing. It's amazing how enterprising you become when your survival is at stake. By the way, this story took place 24 years ago today. The Sahara Desert in June is hot. How hot is it? It's very hot. <laughs> it's damn hot. <laughs> At midday, it reaches 140 degrees Fahrenheit. An exposed man can die of dehydration in less than 20 minutes. When the French ran Algeria, they required travelers to carry five gallons of water per person per day for the crossing. That's how much you drank. Uh, because of the heat, you can only travel before 10 a.m. and after 4 p.m. The midday sun is so hot that if you drive, your engine oil boils. It becomes as thin as water, and your vehicle seizes up and it'll never run again. Six weeks after crossing from Gibraltar, we were ready. Jeff came back with some money from his parents and the vehicle was in perfect condition for the crossing. We realized that if anything did go wrong and we couldn't fix it, we would most certainly die in the desert. Three days before the big push, the actual crossing, we met five Germans in a Volkswagen bus who were waiting for a truck convoy that would cross in a few days. They were gonna play it safe and cross with a convoy, you know, safety in numbers. We told them we were going convoy or no convoy and they decided to cross with us. The Algerian government stamps your passport out of Algeria 500 miles north of the border. From there on, you're on your own, and they couldn't care less what happens to you. As far as they're concerned, you don't exist anymore. So we set out, and I remember this clearly, we set out at sunset on a Thursday following la piste, which is a French word for track, a very accurate word, track, that led straight south across the desert. We drove through the night, as we drove through the night, about 50 miles out, our troubles began. The German's vehicle sunk in and started to get bogged down in the fine sand that had blown over the track. And it also began to break down mechanically. It started getting sand in the carburetor and everything, and it began to delay us hour by hour. We had to get across the 500 miles in two days, or we'd be out of water. So we pressed on as fast as we could. But over and over, the German vehicle got stuck, and we had to stop and drag it out with our four-wheel drive Land Rover, losing time and using precious fuel. Jeff and I took turns driving the Land Rover while the German vehicle drove parallel with us across the flat wasteland. And we kept ourselves motivated by quoting the poem, Carry On back and forth to each other. But I started speaking about 35 years ago, and since then I've given more than 5,000 talks and presentations, now in 79 countries all around the world. 
And the presentations differ. They're business, sales, personal success. But one of the things I've, I've started talking about is the turning points in my life. And I look back and I realize that there have been turning points that after which I was never the same. And you've had the same thing. Everyone has had turning points where they go along, where they meet a person, or they have an experience, or something happens, and it's like going down the road of life and changing direction and never coming back to that point. Well, the first turning point for me, which is relevant to everybody, was the discovery that I was personally responsible for my own life, that nothing in my life was going to change unless I changed. And I still remember it was like a flashbulb going off in my face when I was living in a little one-room apartment and it was 35 degrees below zero outside. I was getting up at five o'clock in the morning to take three buses to my job as a construction laborer and three buses back. And I'm sitting there one night and I realize that nothing's going to change unless I change. And that's the major turning point for an enormous number of people. Actually, the acceptance of personal responsibility for your life and for everything that happens to you is the mark of leadership. So that was the first turning point for me. And after that, you don't make excuses. If you're not happy with something in your life, you change it. If you are not happy with your conditions, then you improve them. But you just take control of your life. Well, that was my first turning point. The second turning point came about three or four years later when I discovered goals. And it hit me again like a flashbulb in the face. I was living on the floor of a friend's one-room apartment. That's all I could find. And I read a little something that said, if you want to be successful, you have to have goals and you have to write them down. So I found a scrap of paper. And I can tell you, I was really poor at that time. Uh, and I wrote down 10 goals that I'd like to achieve. And of course, there are monetary goals and success goals and so on. And then I lost the piece of paper and I got a job in direct selling, knocking on doors. One month later, I'd achieved eight or nine of the 10 goals. Now, the third turning point for me was when I discovered continuous learning, personal development. I th say, I, you know, I felt like a died and go to, went to heaven. I started to read book after book and listen to course after course and attend seminar after seminar. And I found that the more I learned, the faster I moved toward my goals. And the more I accepted responsibility for my own personal development and upgraded my skills and learned, I moved faster and faster toward my goals. Now, there's a remarkable opportunity that you have now. My friend, John Asroff, is holding a brainathon. Now, John is probably the best authority in the world on how you could unlock the powers of your brain to accomplish vastly more than you ever thought possible. He goes way beyond my simple approaches of responsibility and goal setting and personal development, and he shows you how you can sit at the keyboard of your mind and you can actually reprogram your brain, like reprogramming a computer or like a guided missile, so that you start to go straight towards your goals faster and faster and faster. And you've got to attend this brainathon. It's going to have some of the great minds of the world in there showing you how you can literally shape your brain and become anything you want to become and accomplish any goal you can set for yourself.